Welcome to The Summit Club, a weekly podcast series where I uncover the stories, the strategies, the pain and the elation behind the most highly performant people on earth. Summit Club is based on one simple idea, that in the climb of life, there is no summit. Join me as we interview the very best performers across all human endeavors, as we uncover the tools and templates that they use to maximize their potential in their efforts to get to the summit. Hey guys, my guest this week is Philip Kalinko. He's an entrepreneur, content creator. He's the founder of Percal Products, which is a company that houses the largest range of corporate and promotional products in South Africa. Now, as well as being an extremely successful entrepreneur, Philip is a lifelong collector. He's got a vast array of collector's items throughout his entire house. I've seen it, it's mad. Recently, he's taken that passion for collecting and he's forged a path as one of the leading traders of digital collectibles in the form of NFTs, which, as you guys will know, is one of my passions as well. He is one of the most relentless YouTube creators that I've seen posting every day, sometimes multiple times a day. And now there's a lot to learn from Philip. Sadly, we didn't get time to cover everything off in this first show, so he'll definitely be back at some point. All of his socials are going to be linked down below in the description. And if you're new here, please make sure to give us a thumbs up hit that like button, subscribe, make sure that you followed us. If you want to join the Summit Club, we do have our own Discord. The links will be down below too. And I hope you enjoy this episode of the Summit Club. Philip Kalinko, welcome to the Summit Club, episode two. Philip Kalinko, the man himself, the man from South Africa. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, it is incredible to have you on uh, on the channel and talk a little bit, bit about you, your history, your present and your future this is a uh, you are the number one collector man like you've just shown me around your entire collection and uh you are when it comes to collecting stuff you really are the number one collector and crazy to see how much stuff you have welcome man thank you so much for joining me this evening thank you for having me tom really excited to be here my man it's amazing to have you we've we've spent a bit of time together in the past um we managed to get connected a couple of months ago thanks to our our co- podcast hosts our co-hosts for both of our shows Cade Bergman the man from Seattle and uh, incredible to have you man I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the past few months so um we're going to talk a little bit about uh, really about you because you've got a very interesting an interesting past you are a YouTuber just like me but you are also an, a massive enthusiast when it comes to collecting now it doesn't take a pro to see that your background is a lot more colorful than mine the only thing I'm apparently collecting is shoes and uh, you ca- you are collecting everything else. But yeah, well, w- welcome. And um, Philip, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, whereabouts are you? If you don't mind telling telling people where, whereabouts you are, um, that would be amazing. Yeah, so I'm in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm 39 years old. I was actually born in Australia. Um, not many people know that, but I was born in Melbourne, so I've got a blue passport. And when I was about seven years old, my parents immigrated back to South Africa because they were originally from South Africa. They left, went to Australia, um, had me and my little sister there, and then they came back. So I I have very few memories of Australia, haven't been back since, um, but I do want to go, do want to go one day. So yeah, I'm Australian, but been living here for 32 years. And uh, this is what I know is home, always been here. Incredible, man. And tell us a little bit about, uh, about kind of what you've been up to in your time in South Africa. I mean, we, I, I know, but I know about your background, but like give a bit of an overview of uh, what, what you've been up to um, over those few decades and what's kept you busy and how you've ended up in the NFTs. Jeez, it's a, it's a long story. It is a long story. <laughs> it is a long story. Um, I, after school, I studied a, a BCom marketing degree. Bachelor of Commerce in Marketing. While I was studying, an opportunity came to help a lady to sell some products. So basically a good friend of mine, uh, Ellie Perpignan, his mom had a close friend whose father, whose husband passed away. And um, this lady was left with stock. She had no idea where her husband was selling it. It was a small business. And she went to her friend, who was my friend's mom, and said, please, can your son and his friends help me so Ellie came to me and he said, you can sell ice to Eskimos. Let's help this lady. And I said, OK. And we went, we collected some of the products that she had, one of each, um, and started walking around trying to sell it. 
Um, I remember our first sale was to a stationery store in Morrow's Arch, which is a very upmarket shopping center. They bought 10 folders, right, which the total value was maybe 20 pounds. And we took the rest of the day off. It was our biggest sale. <laughs> we were we were we still had to pay about 15 pounds to the lady, which was fine. We each took two and a half pounds and we took the day off. And that's how it started. Um, so I was studying. Um, I was also I was putting myself through university. So I was also working as a waiter. I was also selling supplements. Um, so I was really busy. Um, I didn't have a collection like this behind me. Um, that came a lot later. And uh, yeah, just put my head down. I was always very driven, very, very driven to succeed. Um, uh, you know, my dad uh, had a very up and down financial life. And I watched him be on top of the world financially, really, really succeed starting amazing businesses. And I watched him at the bottom as well. Um, and I always wanted to just make sure that I you know, could do as much as I can not to experience that. I'm still young, so I don't know what's ahead of me, but so far, so good. Um, so yeah, I'm typically very risk adverse, which is quite funny that I'm in NFTs because um, my dad was a risk taker. He would build these businesses. As soon as it was good, he would sell it and move on to the next one. You know, he built some very big businesses, some that are still around today, um, but then some wouldn't work. You know, um, whereas I'm the opposite. I've been running Perkel, the, the corporate gift company that started with that lady's stock for the last 20 years almost, so almost 20 years. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've stayed put. So that's that's my background outside of NFTs. Yeah, then, well, that sounds, it sounds incredibly interesting, the fact that you clearly, it sounds like you have entrepreneurship in your blood, right? Sounds like yeah. you, you, have, you have that... Uh, that's, I guess that's what kind of pushed you down the path of what you studied at university to some, to some level. Yeah, I would say so for sure. And My dad actually wanted me to be an accountant. So he was an accountant. And in those days, you know, you could be an accountant, a lawyer or a doctor. That was it. So the, at my first year of studying, it was also a BCom, but my major was accounts. And I just absolutely hated it. Absolutely hated it. I really didn't enjoy it. Um, and I remember going to him and saying, listen, this is your life, not mine, that you want me to live. And I'm not going to do that. I'm living mine. I'll keep doing the be calm, but I'm not going to do accounts. And he was upset. Eh? <laughs> like he wanted the best for me. He, he, that was the way to have the best, you know, um, in his eyes. Um, and I just couldn't do it. I, I absolutely hated it. So I, I pivoted, kept doing the be calm, but changed my major to marketing. Really interesting. And you, um, you, you, you clearly like, um, it sounds like you were industrious when you were at university, you had jobs, you were doing multiple things to like pay your way through that. Um, it sounds like, like you said, you've always been driven. Um, what do you, do you think that your experience that you had with your father kind of directed you down that route or, or yeah, what, what kind sure. of made I you remember, go down that path? I remember going with him to his store. So one of the companies that he started was is Stacks. It's still around today. Stacks Superstores. They're like an electronics um a store and he started it um and i used to go with him on holidays to work and i used to watch him so like you know there was one time a funny story there was a washing machine that this lady was looking at or whatever she wanted to see the manager so i went down with my dad um and she said you know that this place there's dust all over this dishwasher and he said don't worry ma'am we don't charge extra for the dust <laughs> so that that was my that was my dad everything was a sales a sales pitch um and i think they bought me my, both my parents bought me up very very well um from the money perspective so i would get i would get pocket money when i was young um if i wanted to spend it i could but they explained to me that i should try save some of it so i think i had those those uh, you know that that from an early age but my, watching my dad everything was a negotiation and watching that definitely definitely shaped me for sure. Interesting. So you, you, you said that you were, had the capabilities of selling ice to Eskimos. You clearly had like the uh, uh, ability to like just sell stuff, but was that to some extent modeled on how you, you watched your dad behave and operate and negotiate? I think so. I think also like I've got five sisters. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know that about me. So I, I didn't know that in a, in a big family. Any brothers? Um, 
no brothers, but now five brother-in-laws. Uh, wow. You know, so I've got <laughs> so the, I've now, now have, finally got the male now fully influence. Got a five, five aside teams uh, together. You've uh, yeah, you can play a, a girls versus boys game out in this out in the, yeah. Out I've the got garden. I think seventeen or eighteen nieces and nephews. Wow, so a, a massive family. But I think growing up, first of all, being the only boy um, was tough, and I had to learn to you know, negotiate my way through. It's not just negotiate. I mean, everything. I mean, I was, it was five against one all the time, yeah. um, you know, and uh, yeah, I think a big family in general, regardless of whether it's girls or boys, um, you know, you, if you, both of you want the same piece of chicken, you, you there's only one way to, you got to negotiate your way to the best piece of chicken and everything, everything was a negotiation. So I think, I think that helped. I think, uh, yeah, I think also you do get born with some degree of it also, I would imagine there's nature and nurture involved, but I do think for some reason, I mean, I used to sell stuff at school from when I was young, 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 I, I remember selling popcorn. Um, I bought up a little popcorn machine, not an industrial one, a home popcorn machine. And I would sit there making packets of popcorn and take them all to school the next day and sell them. I made picture frames out of uh, um, paddle sticks, like from ice cream. And I, 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 whatever I would make and I would sell and I would save and I would, you know, from when I was very young, it, 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 was, it was there from the beginning for sure. That's quite funny because that's quite a common story that I've heard from many different entrepreneurs, whether it's Gary Vee talking about doing his, um, you know, his his initial story was that or his kind of story of selling was how he would go to uh, his neighbors. He'd pick a flower from their front garden, from their front garden, and he'd go knock on their door and he'd sell them their own flower. <laughs> and yeah. so, and it's, as, you know, it sounds like these, I hear these stories all the time with uh, with entrepreneurs. They talk about their that when they were young, they would either they'd be selling candy at school, like you. You were selling popcorn at school. You were selling picture frames. Why? Why? I I don't know. I don't I don't really know. I saw that I could buy more cards, like my tops cards and stuff, if okay. I had some money. I only had a certain amount of pocket money every month. Didn't cover the the needs for these collectibles as a young collectible like marbles and cards and stuff. And I realized if I could get more, I could I could accumulate more. But you know what the funny thing is, I I've got three beautiful boys, um, and I see the same trait in one out of the three so far. So not all of them, but Jake, I can see, and I've seen it for a long time. I mean he. I can see it. He negotiates everything with me, but like to accumulate, he's got me against against the ropes. Honestly, um, you know, he just thinks of angles of how to get stuff. I just, I, I like I said, no, four hundred times, and we we coming <laughs> out of there with all the Pokemon cards that there are, you know. Um, so I see it in him. So there's definitely a nature to it. You know, Danny doesn't yeah. care. Um, so they're twins, Danny and Jake, which is also very interesting because they are identical really? twins really? and they're completely, completely different. Wow. And Danny does not care about things. There's wow. no, he's creative. Mm. He's creative. So like what he's busy with at the moment is he's built a, 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 a big bouncing ball out of elastic bands. So started with a little bouncing ball and all his pocket money is going to elastic bands, bigger ones and bigger ones. And he's got a ball the size of a basketball at the moment. Um, but he loves that because it's creating something. Right? <laughs> he's very creative. Um, but, you know, it's just funny because I do. I see it in Jake. I've said to Bianca from the beginning, Jake will be very successful one day. Now, yeah, um, that is funny you say that because you before this call, you showed me around your entire office in your study. Um, and it is a much larger room than what this, like the the view that the audience are getting right now. It kind of weaves off around the back and to the right and to the left. And you have walls of walls and cabinets and shelves of loads of different types of collectibles. So we're talking about, talk us through some of your, all of your collectible collection, the collections that you have, like some of the things that you've, because it clearly, if that was what you were saying, that the reason you wanted to sell stuff was just because you wanted to collect stuff. Uh, that's that's incredible because you know you've just shown me all of the collections you have. What what kind of collections have you been into? So uh, in the beginning, it was garbage pile kids and marbles. Um, all the marbles now belong to Jake. <laughs> As I said, he's very <laughs> you know and the other kids, but I think he's he's probably negotiated them from the other kids. Like he'll give <laughs> Danny el elastic bands to get <laughs> to get marbles. <laughs> um, but I had a massive, massive, beautiful marble collection with lots of different types. Probably about I don't know five thousand marbles. Um, I used to actually when I was young keep them in you know you get toolbox drawers for nails. 
I used to have all the different marbles together in a drawer. The, the goonies, the pearlies, the, all of them in the drawer with a label. So I was always like that as, as long as I can remember. So marbles was a big thing. I've got a lot of basketball cards from when I was young. I used to collect those pogs. I still have some. Those plastic oh, slam slam classic. things. Yeah. I've got I've got a lot of those still from when I was young. <laughs> um those garbage pal kids, which I showed you, even though I, I ended up losing all of them. So what actually happened with those is that my mom's an artist and um she said those cards are actually stickers. You can you can take them off and stick them. So she said, wouldn't it be a lovely idea for you to do your shelf in your bedroom in these? And it was a lovely idea. So I ended up using all of my, all of them. So they still in my parents' old house on some lucky kid's shelf as stickers. Um, and then, you know, when I got to adult life, I decided to track them down again, not those exact ones, but to get the collection again. So garbage pal kids, hot wheel cars, uh, lots of stuff, lots and lots of too much stuff, Coca-Cola lots of yeah. coca-cola stuff it's it's difficult to to kind of describe but yeah I, like i said i've seen it before just off to his right he has got a um a complete wall full of folders of those uh the garbage pail kids and then it looks like you walk into a hot wheels shop he's got like like rows and rows of and d deep like like many 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 different like cars still in their packets and it looks like you're in a shop it's incredible so like my, my point is, is that you are a collector through and through. And so it, it is it is no surprise that you have kind of taken that. And I kind of joked, I was like, well, your office feels like it's full. Like where else, where are you going to put, you know, the new stuff? And you're like, well, that's why I'm in NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true. Yeah. And you know, that collector gene, I, I've seen it in so many NFT guys. So many, I mean, even just looking at your shoes behind you, I've also got an amazing shoe collection. I love my shoes as well, you know, um, but yeah, I do think, I do think it's, uh, that spoke to me on the NFT side, the collectible nature, the scarcity or, or supposed scarcity, you know, there's still 10,000 of them. Um, but yeah, definitely that plays into what, what, you know, caught me with NFTs. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I think the NFT world, as we've seen it over the past year has attracted many different types of people, people into it. And we've had, um, we've, I've got, in my group in the summit club we've got like art collectors who are kind of niche niche art collectors they'll follow certain influencers or artists and uh collect the stuff that they've created they they've created um and then we've got traders so they will be looking at high volume trading and swing trading um and then also kind of we've got like blue chip kind of hot traders or or collectors and we have many different types and I'm, I've, I would definitely say that I'm more here from uh, the kind of art and the tech side, not the like collectible side. So I'm kind of like my, my, my dad is a, a like an art collector. Um, and I kind of get, I feel like I, I've got that kind of gene, the, the nature part of that. Uh, so yeah, I like collecting stuff. I like, like fashion is a big part for me. So I'm, I'm massively into fashion. So I'm kind of like into those are the, the realms that I'm interested in. Now, you've obviously, Cade, when I first spoke to him about you and he was like, look, you've got to meet this Philip guy. He is like, he is a legit trader. Now, knowing what I know about you now, are, are you a trader or are you just a, are you a diamond hander? I didn't know, Cade suggested that you were, uh, you, you were good at trading, but are you good at trading? I've become I've become a trader in the okay. very beginning. I was a diamond hander all the way. I still have my first twenty NFTs that I minted from that project that failed. I could have sold I could have sold them um, early on. I probably can't sell them now. <laughs> but I I was ne I loved I loved them. I loved them, and I was never going to sell them. And then yeah. I got into the next project, and I felt the same way. And the next project, I felt the same way. And it took the first bear market in sort of September last year, or whenever it was, you know, September, October, yeah. maybe October, November, yeah. to early December, and then December yeah. took off. So it took that market when I watched like stuff that had massive value, um, just disappear. And I thought, hold on a second, like, you know, I, it made me reevaluate, am I really wanting to collect these things? Or am I am I wanting to flip it for a profit if I'm able to, right? 
Um, so there's certain ones that I, I wouldn't mind holding. So blue chips like your board AP ecosystem, um, because I think that, why? Because I actually think they'll appreciate in value down the road because they they are collectible in a way. But but the value side is linked to it. So because of that, I've now I, I've changed. I, since then, everything has got a price. Absolutely everything. It doesn't matter how much I love it. Like I've changed my PFP for the show so many times that I finally just made it my face. Because when when an offer comes and I you know I stand to make that sort of money, I, I have to take it. I can't not now. Interesting. Whereas to begin with, no, you could give me any offer on certain things. I didn't care. Um, and if I loved an NFT, I would pay anything for it. It's, so I wouldn't buy a floor in the beginning. I would I would go sort of what speaks to me and whatever. Then I realized that those are harder to sell, especially if they're middle of the road and you've paid like 40, 50 percent over floor. So I, I've had to become more of a trader in it. Um, but yeah, I wish the space was such that I could just diamond hand, that every project was good. And I had the faith that that all de uh, deliver long term. But sadly, it's, it's not the case, you know. Uh, absolutely i can very very much aware that that's not the case and uh, you've got quite a when it comes to like the the purchases the, the the kind of the pinnacle of purchases within the nft world you have made that purchase you have made the purchase of one of the board ape yacht club the 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 top of the top you made that purchase talk to us about that talk you explained you explained that you um you have a thesis that they will uh, appreciate in value I hold that thesis as well, just as, and I'm not a holder, but I look at what they have, what they have is brand IP. And to me, it's like, I can kind of see where, where that's going. And the upside suggests, suggest, you know, suggests that it's quite high, but for you, talk us, talk us about that. When did you buy into the, the board AP Yacht Club and was it, was it nerve wracking? Were you, uh, were you excited? Did you celebrate? Yeah. So, so my, my introduction was a mutant. Um, I, I got into it with a mutant, that one with crazy hair behind me, it was you, such yeah. a cool mutant, yeah. that actually Seth Green bought it and then someone stole it from his wallet. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. I that's remember, my yeah. mu that's yeah. my per mutant <laughs> that's being held hostage somewhere. <laughs> well, it's not my, it's not mine anymore. Um. So so that was my introduction to the board Ape Yacht Club ecosystem. Um. And I got the Ape Coin airdrop, which was like six ETH, and I, at the time, and I cashed it out immediately, and I paid six Ethereum for the mutant. Then it came to other side and I got the other side land and immediately knowing what I knew because I was more more in the space and educated in the space. I claimed the land and I sold it immediately at 40 Ethereum at the top. How many? When one. I just had my cool guy sold it to Seth Green for 40, 42 Ethereum. He bought it. Straight... He, Seth Green bought it off you. So I sold it to a guy who sold it to Seth Green. Got you, got you, got you. Okay. Wow. So so I sold it at the absolute top. Yeah. And ETH was about $4,000 at the time. But my wow. mistake was that I never converted that to USD. I kept it in ETH. That was a big mistake. Because if I had converted that to, and obviously I didn't know at the time, I thought it was going to a million dollars, um, like everyone else did. Like everyone and, else but, did. Yeah, but <laughs> knowing what I know, yeah, BTC was 100k in a few months' time, and uh, yeah, Ethereum yeah. was definitely going to 10k. <laughs> but knowing what I know now, I would have converted it. So so much so yeah. that when I sold my board ape, I converted it immediately to USDC. So I've learned my lesson there. So so that was so then I you know you're sitting there and you're thinking okay I've got I, and I've got some ETH to play with. What has served me well? Well, the board API Club ecosystem, I, I, I got my money back for what I paid just in an airdrop of, of a sure. coin. Sure. And I got the other deed land and I was late to the party. I mean, if I had minted a board ape to begin with, I would have had a dog, a mutant. So so for me, it was just like, OK, this is the one ecosystem where I can make money. So that I think planted the seed that one day I would like to get a board ape. That, yeah. that seems to be, you know, I like the ecosystem from the perspective that it served me well. Um, I, I'm not in the discord of any project. I mean, I, I have them all there and I check announcements, but I don't have time to spend time in general. So it's not about the community for me. It's not about a flex. 
none of that. I really don't care what people think. Uh, for me, it was simply because this ecosystem knows how to deliver more than anything else. So then it got to the point I had sold my mutant, um, I bought a Clonex, bought a Doodle, bought whatever, spent it all on good on good NFTs, right? Spent it all. And then I was just sitting there thinking, you know, Bored Apes are looking juicy at the price that they were. So they were 80 Ethereum and ETH was $1,100. So if you look on USD value, that's pretty much the lowest it's been in six yeah. months to a year. Yeah. So I thought to myself, I thought to myself, this is the time. If you want to get it, now's the time. So I had to sell quite a few NFTs to do that. And I was selling at the bottom, right? So Got I you. took a loss on Got quite you. a few NFTs and I had to put some fiat in. But I put it in, I checked the other day at $1,000 to ETH. So $1,000 was the value. So I put... Put about half in from fiat and the rest was from selling and i still held i still have the same clone uh, that i've always had i still held some but i had to sell quite a few um and then i went to bianca first my wife and i said so look you know she knows what i'm doing she helps me with my thumbnails i mean obviously she knows what i'm doing i'm doing this all the time um she supports me through thick and thin always has so if, she, if i find something has potential, she supports me, which I'm really thankful for. And I said to her, look, I want to buy a board ape. She said to me, let's look. And we that's how she supports me. And we looked at the floor and we saw, and I saw one that I loved, 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 loved. And as I was ready to buy it, someone had bought it. I really loved it. Um, and so I was looking with Bianca and we found a few, put a few offers and because I, I you know i want to get a deal if i can so even though i liked it and i had the eth put a cup uh, put a couple of offers on the ones i liked and i found finally i saw that this one got accepted and it was an amazing feeling it really was it, it really was because uh, half of that money was built from nothing just working in the space project advising from the beginning a mod community manager consultant um you know just working in the space um and half of it is hard earned money from working out of the space but um yeah it felt it felt amazing and i, I knew i would i said to bianca at the time and to myself if i get offered double within a short period of time double i will take it and i i would check every day not looking for an offer but i check all my blue chips every day to check the offers and i saw a us dollar offer it was in usd for literally double what I paid, literally. So I paid 80 Ethereum uh, when ETH was $1,000 and my offer was 177,000 US dollars in USD. So after the commission, I walked away with literally double and did I didn't you, even go did to you the end. Did you sell, I accepted you sold, it? You sold it? Immediately. Amazing. How, how, long, in, in, how, how long was the period between? I think a month. So but it, this, is make, a very, this is incredible because you, it, it sounds like, yeah, to to validate Cade, uh, yeah, it sounds like you are an incredible trader. <laughs> and then I cashed, and then I cashed it out, converted yeah. it from ETH uh, to US uh, to USD, and from USD into my bank account. Yeah. So now I'm up in fiat, and I've got, I've still got beautiful NFTs. I've actually got a mutant, I've got a clone, I've got a world of woman, I've got a cool cat, I've still got, and all of it is house money now, all of it, and but. The one thing is I look at the board ape floor every day. Yeah. So I want to get in. If I have to sell the mutant and, and a few others to get there, I do want to get it again. And again, if someone offers me double in such a short period of time, I'll take it. I've I've worked for every cent I've ever made. I know how hard it is to make $80,000, let alone in three weeks. If I can yeah. do that, I will do that all time over. And, th and this is really, really important because what you're what you're demonstrating here is that you have a very clear very very clear entry point and you have a very very clear exit strategy and this is something that we've i've talked about in the past which is where i think back in when when everything was just incredibly hot and people were making 10x's in a day or you know 20x's in a day just riding all of the volume the crazy volume people got greedy so if it wasn't a t if it wasn't a, you know a 4x they would just hold on they just like hold on and then you know, the high chances are just dumped to zero. Whereas you've just said, you've been like, my exit strategy is 2x, done. 2x yeah. and done. And having that, if you just double your money, that is a huge, huge amount of return that you can you can get. And and incredible story to- uh, well, I, got, yeah. I got lucky, Tom, on, on the ape, I got lucky because the floor at the time when I got the offer 
was about 120,000 USD. So I, I looked at afterwards, I went to this guy's account and I was just looking, I was interested. Why, why did he offer so much over floor? It's not a rare, it, it's a good looking one, I thought, but f there's a few good looking ones. And he actually made the same offer on three apes and there's nothing in common between those three. So I would understand if they were all white hair, because mine was white hair, or all Hawaiian shirts. He loves Hawaiian shirts, fine. But there was nothing. But what I did see was that he's got a lot of other deed land, a lot. And what I suspect is that he's trying to marry the land to the ape. So he must have had the, the board ape land of those three apes and wanting to marry that land together with that. That's the only thing that made sense. So I was happy to hold it. I wasn't looking to sell it. It wasn't listed for sale. But I got the offer and uh, I don't, whatever the reason is, it was, the, you know, he wanted it and uh, congratulations to whoever bought it. Well, do you know what? Congratulations to you because um, we know, as, and a lot of the stories are coming out over, over the last couple of months of, Many of the influencers, people that we work with, um, and can you know hold my hand up that uh, I'm definitely like down in NF from you know my NFT trading. I'm not up. Um, it's not a lot, but I haven't you know all things considered, I'm not in. I'm not in like a positive gain from when I started. But what I have gained is a very robust network, a really deep, comprehensive network of legends like yourself, people that I work with on a day to day basis, and to me. That's myself like looking forward and the the and I've said this, I've been saying this for months, all of the money that I pissed down the drain or gone to the Ethereum miners um, through gas fees, all of that is just what I consider my tuition fees for being able to have the, the pleasure and the opportunity for meeting people like yourself and learning from people like yourself. So yeah, it's been, um, I mean, it's been a pleasure getting to know you recently. And I foresee this as being a super long and uh, amazing relationship. And I'm hopefully I can come and hang out in your man cave in your den and take a look at your DB5 and hold it. Apparently it's 50 kilograms. That thing is actually a lot bigger 30, than you think. 30. The, yeah. the set of teeth that you can see down below his arm is actually bigger than his entire head. That's how big those yeah. things are. So yeah, yeah. Um, Philip, is there um, any, um, have you got any any kind of like, Closing, uh, closing comments. Where, where can people like follow you? What are you up to at the moment? Mainly, um, with when it comes to content creation, you said you also do advisory stuff, consultation stuff. How can people get in contact with you and best to follow along with you, mate? Hundred percent. I just want to clarify. I've I've made a lot of bad trades and lost a lot on others. You only really hear about the good ones. Um, and you know, if I actually had to tally it up, I don't know. I probably a little bit up, but but not nearly where I was if I had sold everything when I should have sold everything. So, you know, I I've also paid school fees, and you know, I got lucky on one or two trades. Um, but I've been unlucky on a hundred, two hundred. I got five hundred NFTs that I've hidden in my hidden folder. Not all hidden that i've hidden so just know that so yeah um on my side look you, you guys can find me i've got the as tom said the youtube channel um do i upload two three times a day always nft content um some crypto stuff and also some advice um so you can follow me on youtube twitter I've also got my own little private Discord that's open to anyone, completely free, that you can come into, always posting uh, alpha calls and some whitelists and things like that. So come and join, you'll be very welcome. What I'm up to now is, you know, I've stopped doing all the modding and community management stuff, even though I still get the same founders coming back to me, asking me to come back, which is a huge compliment. I just don't have the time. Um, and I'd rather just build a community there, you know, uh, which is what I'm doing. So, you know, our Discord has got about 500 people in it. Each and every one of them, there's been no marketing for it. Each and every one of them are fans of the show. Um, and I don't even know what I'm going to do with that. I just enjoy the community side of it. Um, I do offer alpha services in other Discords. We've got about 22 people signed up that we post every single day in their Discords. There's a team of five people um, on the NFT show that do research and, and help me. Um, so if anyone out there is a project owner and looking for value and utility to their holders, 
uh, great alpha, great calls, stuff like that is something that we can do. We set everything up in your own Discord. And I still do some consulting and advising for new projects specifically. Um, obviously, like all day doing project reviews. And you'll see I've done a lot. I mean, I, I look, there's 700 videos uploaded to YouTube. And I've only been doing this since January on the YouTube side. So I've, I've reviewed maybe 200, 300 projects. Um, and I do, you, you get to know and you get to see what works and what doesn't. So that's really what I'm up to now. But I really just also want to be a like honest voice in the space, you know. And I think you're the same. And I think Kate's the same, which is why we click. And Nate is the same. Uh, shout out, we always shout out Nate. Always um, shout what out a Nate. legend. The top G. Yeah, a real, real legend. Real legend and has helped me enormously and become a very good friend of mine. Um, but but those are the people that I stick to, is guys who are saying it like it is, um, and just there to guide people. You know, I actually made a, a video, which I'm really proud of, has barely gotten any views, um, but called My In Real Life Investment Thesis. And actually, guys, I, to say that, you know, the only reason I'm spending some money on NFTs is because it's a tiny percentage of my wealth. And this is gambling. And don't do it if you can't pay fees. And I actually take you through the entire story of when I started being a bit risky with a tiny bit of my wealth, but what I did to get to this point, um, I, I showed pictures, I actually cried in the video. Oh, um, wow. So, and no one has seen it. And it's on my channel, you know. Right. But this it, that, is, would, that would be my thing. My in this real is life. The call. In, this is the call to push everyone to watch this because that is the stories, the stories that we care about. And this is something that hopefully at some point we'll be able to dig into. I've had the pleasure of talking to you about this on your, on your channel and talking about your history and um, because you, you talk about all of the work that you currently do in, in web three and NFTs, but I know that you are a full-time like CEO or managing director of your own company. Um, a, one of the, like the forces, uh, of companies in your vertical like category in 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 uh, in South Africa so to do all of the stuff that you're doing on top of that running a successful company is um is it's really it's really incredible so I'm I'm going to go and watch that straight after this I'm going to pop it on the TV and I'm going to watch it and I hope hopefully I don't cry but um incredible you're gonna to cry. Hear, yeah, you're to gonna cry. Story, I cry yeah. but link it please link it to the I'll description definitely link of it down. this Please, I'll link it down below. That, that that is the real side that people don't hear, and it's like basically there are there aren't I don't know any shortcuts to do it. There, it's hard work, sacrifice of twenty years of blood, sweat, and tears, and sacrifice to allow me the luxury to go and spend eighty thousand dollars on a picture of a stupid monkey, um, without it being a, a worry if it goes to zero. Uh, you know. Um, but it's important. It's an important video and I hope more people see it because that's why I'm here. I want to be the sober voice and the honest voice in, in a sea through, full of videos, how to make a million dollars overnight and how I flipped this one dollar into a million dollars in a week. It's all bullshit. Um, so that's what that's what got me wanting to do this. Um, and that's really where it's at. So yeah. That's that's I, where you I, can find me. I appreciate you, and I'm as someone who is who is very intent on taking the long road, being patient, and not trying to flip one dollar to a million dollars in a, in a week. I'm very keenly aware of how how long it takes, and so I'm, I'm really I'm hoping to learn from you. I hope you don't mind if I send you questions around how you've built your Please. business because. Uh, I would, Please. yeah, I would really. Tom, really you know, I'm here anytime. When you came on my channel, we had an instant connection. Anytime, come Thanks, and and I'm the same to anyone else. Anyone who comes in my Discord with the real intention of just being there and like uh, you know, adding to the community. Um, and if anyone needs anything, they know I'm there. I um, mean, that's one thing that I've realized is that when I was coming up along the ranks outside of NFTs. There were people who I looked up to that took time to answer what was probably stupid questions and guide me. And it's about paying it forward for me. They're both the NFT journey and everything else. So I, at any stage, I'm here to you and available to you even before this video. I hope you know that. But please watch it and let me know what you think of it. Because And please can everyone watch it. I don't care if you watch my review on this crap or that crap. Watch my in real life investment uh, video, please. Can't wait to go. I'm going to pop, pop it on right now. So. Philip, thank you so much, mate. And um, hope you have a lovely evening. And thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, make sure to go follow him. All of the links are going to be down below in the box down below. Go watch his video. Learn from someone who has been there and grinded out on a successful career in life the hard way and the way it should be done and the way it really is done. So yeah, learn from, learn from the best. Um, this guy is one of them. So yeah, Philip. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me, man. I'm so happy we could do this. Thank you. I know Always. you. Always. Thanks, dude. Cool, my brother.
I hope you enjoyed that show. If you haven't already done so, hit the like button down below. Make sure to subscribe so that you can learn from the very best that I'm going to be interviewing at the Summit Club. If you didn't know this already, I also have another podcast called The Unorthodox Podcast that I do with my co-founders, Liam and Mark over at Unorthodox. We're a Web3 marketing consultancy. If you want to go check it out, it's quite a lot of fun. If you want to learn a bit more about crypto and everything Web3, that's the place to come check it out. We interview some of the most interesting people within Web3 and also executives across some of the biggest brands on the planet. Come and join us. The links are also going to be down below in the description and I'll see you next time.